If I compare today's map to what was passed off the floor of the House, I mean, it's a night and day difference. I mean, there are six districts that didn't exist before. Um, the, the discovery in this case uh, really showed a very ugly side of redistricting. I mean, there were emails that were produced, and, and the case was very, very clear. I mean, the object of the game was to draw a district that had the illusion of minority dominance, but these map drawers knew very specifically you know, the areas of, of town where people didn't vote. And so while on the, uh, at the 30,000 foot view, you had a district that, that had a, a perception of a Hispanic majority, but election performance indicated that these folks weren't active. And that's okay, I mean, this, you can't force people to vote. I mean, that, that's, but while they were doing that, they knew exactly where those communities were that were politically engaged and politically cohesive, and they were taking them out and dispersing them in other places. Uh, you know, that's not what redistricting ought to be about. I mean, I think whoever's in charge, obviously that's the way it's always been. You know, you, you preserve your political power. I have no problem with that. The minute you do it on the backs of minority community, then I have a big problem with that. Uh, and, and we've demonstrated what we're willing to do. And, you know, frankly, uh, even if it meant moving the Texas primary a couple of times, that's how important of an issue it was and still is for Malk. Uh, and, and I think that, that on another level, I think it's really excited some people. I think people are looking for, you know, for, for minorities and Latinos to actually start taking bigger positions and taking stands uh, in a very visible way because I think it serves as a basis of inspiration for people to understand that if they get a little bit more engaged, you know, that they're going to be supporting people that are willing to have these kinds of fights and make, you know, you know, make tremendous gains uh, for the community. I mean, that with, with, with one lawsuit, we've improved this map with six Hispanic districts in, in Texas. Uh, and we believe that, that this court in D.C. could possibly make that even a little bit better. Uh, and that would have never happened uh, had we sat this one out on the sidelines. I think there were some great advocates involved and would have done a good job. But I think it takes a certain perspective of somebody, you know, of a caucus that, that knows both sides of the process. We know our way around the courtroom as lawyers, but we also know our way around the policy room and how things get done and what happens behind the scenes. And if there's going to be a bone buried somewhere, where is it buried? Uh, I think that our, our caucus really uh, was able to uncover, you know, lots of things that otherwise might have been glossed over or overlooked because it, it was insignificant to the outside world. The process seems to inevitably generate tensions even among coalition partners. And there was, you know, some coverage of that publicly and, you know, some degree of talk about the negotiations with the Attorney General, who was in, who was oh, out yeah. at, at various stages, you know, the outcome. I mean, and I, and I think that to some degree that seems unavoidable. Is that, how durable is that? I mean, how, A, how accurate was that? Maybe that wasn't very accurate, but it does seem that there was some tension among different Latino organizations at different points, perhaps some tension among African American and Latino organizations. Well, I, you know, I, I, because this is an educational program, I mean, I think it's important to get into. I, I know there are people who would love to write about this. I mean, so I'll, I'll be very, very careful. Uh, I mean, the issue is very real. I think that, that from a demographic perspective, uh, you see minorities growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, frankly, from a socioeconomic perspective, they all tend to reside in certain areas, certain concentrations of major cities. Uh, and when you have this, you know, cohesion among minority groups, you know, to stand together and, and support each other's candidates in the general elections, I think primaries become, you know, very, very, uh, very, very competitive. Uh, and, and so, you, you know, we saw, you know, instances where, where people in certain parts of the state would say, hey, you know, we're, we're concerned about there being too many Hispanics in this part of the state because that's a threat to our existing, you know, status quo. And, uh, but, you know, again, I mean, you know, this is something that you can't, you know, you, you cannot fix. I mean, this is, this, this is the reality of, of, a, of a state that's changing by the day, particularly with, with respect to Latino growth. Now, on the outside about, you know, people being critical of others who negotiated with the attorney general or, or uh, you know, trying to cut deals, uh, it was pretty clear, at least from my viewpoint, that if a minority group that wasn't sort of considered to be a team player, if you will, on other issues, uh, if, if they engaged in negotiation with the attorney general, that was, you know, that was a, you know, that was a personal foul. You couldn't do that. That was, uh, you know, cutting a deal with the enemy. But if, you know, other minority groups, uh, uh, were doing it, it was sort of almost, you know, it was almost not necessarily, I'm going to say blessed, but it was, you know, it was encouraged. It was, uh, it was okay. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, I like to, to take up for groups like Maldef, uh, you know, because they seem to catch a lot of uh, criticism for, for presenting a plan with the Attorney General. And, and what I learned 
in one year of redistricting, uh, in one year I learned 40 years of redistricting history. Uh, and, and I was told about time after time that you know, certain party leaders in both parties decided the outcome and it didn't matter what the minority community thought. Uh, the only difference today is that those making those decisions happen to be minorities and they're making decisions that's in the best interest of their constituency. And there were certain people that didn't like that. Weren't, they're not used to being in that role. They're used to calling the shots, not you know, being on the receiving end. And so I, I, I you know, had a very candid conversation with Nancy Pelosi when she was in San Antonio. She asked me that question. And a member of Congress who was in the room criticized Maldef. And I said, nobody in this room should say one thing negative about Maldef. Because decisions were being made on their backs decade after decade, and nobody cared. You know, now Maldef's in a position to actually have an impact. Uh, and, and, you know, all of a sudden that's cause for concern. Well, that's, you know, that's, you reap what you sow. I mean, and, and, and frankly, um, you know, I think they did a, they, they made a good call. Uh, I think that you can, you know, take, you know, political, you know, sides and, but Mal Maldiv doesn't play the politics. Malk doesn't play the politics. I mean, we drew a district, uh, Malk drew a district in West Texas that would probably, I think, uh, I think Barack Obama, President Obama received 30% of the vote in the district we drew in West Texas. We knew it was going to elect a Hispanic Republican. We were fine with that. We were fine with that. Uh, you know, the, the, the most important thing is that it could be done. I mean, no one ever, I mean, I don't know if you'd ever think that in Odessa and Midland and places like that, you can elect a Hispanic. Um, you now can. Unfortunately, that didn't happen in this round, but, you know, you, you don't have to wait 10 years to bring a Section 2 claim. You can bring a Section 2 claim at any time. So who knows? We may revisit that down the road. Uh, but but uh, I think that that more of these, uh, these, these uh, staged events between minority groups oftentimes had political motive uh, and they weren't done purely on race issues uh, and ethnicity issues. I think that you know, minority communities saw this as an opportunity for minorities. Sometimes politics gets in the way of that. Yeah, I mean, I mean so, so it sounds to me like you think that the real takeaway is that things are complex when you're actually at the table and everybody's a full player. Everyone's a full player. And I think that, you know, again, this is a sign that this is a state. I, I think redistricting from going forward will be done much differently now. And I think that, that minorities have now recognized that they will have a growing role at the decision-making table. You know, so when there's talks about revamping the system and going to these commissions, you have minorities going, hey, hey, wait a minute, you know, since 1970, we've been on the receiving end of deals being cut and us being, you know, being left out. Now we're in a position to have an impact and right those wrongs for the last 30, 40 years. Don't take it away from us.